lymphoproliferative disorders encompass um, an actual probably four or five hours worth of talks. So what I decided to do today was to talk a little bit about lymphoproliferative disorders in general, and then we're really going to talk about some of the um, lower grade um, lymphoproliferative disorders today, and then we can try to add in um, some of the um, higher grade ones in a different lecture. So it's a heterogeneous group of diseases, but the characteristics that they all share are uncontrolled production um, of lymphocytes. It's a monoclonal population, right? A monoclonal lymphocytosis. Some of them have more lymphadenopathy associated with them than others, and then some of them have more bone marrow infiltration than others. They're caused by cells of the lymphatic system that grow excessively. B cell lymphoproliferative disorders are much more common than T cell, particularly in the United States and in Europe. If you go to Asia, um, Japan, China, then T cells are more common than B cells. They originate when mechanisms of control of both proliferation, but also of programmed cell death break down and result in uncontrolled autonomous increase in um, the number of these cells leading to um, lymphocytosis and lymphadenopathy, and then there can be extra nodal sites involved. And so the bone marrow is considered an extra nodal site. And then there are other um, organs in our body, particularly our gastrointestinal tract, that has um, a increased likelihood of having extra nodal involvement. So the ones that we're going to talk about today are going to be the B cell. Um, lymphocytic disorders, including chronic lymphocytic leukemia, promyelocytic leukemia, mantle cell, hairy cell, and uh, marginal zone lymphomas. I'm not going to talk about the T-cell lymphoproliferative disorders because they're much less common. So what are the clinical features that all of these disorders um, share? Well, interestingly, men are more commonly affected than women. They may be anemic and they may have thrombocytopenia. And anemia and thrombocytopenia in lymphoproliferative disorders can be from really two etiologies. One is that the bone marrow may be so crowded by these, um, this lymphocyte proliferation that you just have decreased production of red blood cells and platelets. But the other that you always have to kind of keep in mind is that because this is a proliferation of B cells and B cells make antibodies, anemia and thrombocytopenia in these patients can be immune mediated or autoimmune. So we most commonly would see a warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia or ITP antiplatelet antibodies that are being generated by the clone of malignant cells. They can be neutropenic, they can experience weight loss, and the weight loss can be related to um, early satiety from splenomegaly, or it can be a symptom of hypermetabolism and cytokine release. Lymphadenopathy, which can be any place, right? It can be peripheral where we can palpate it. It can be mesenteric. It could be retroperitoneal. It can be hyalur. Um, it can be anywhere. Splenomegaly, hepatomegaly. They can also have um, disease affecting other organs. So we think about the central nervous system and the GI tract probably as being the top two, but you can also get lymphomatous involvement anywhere. You can get it um, in the um, jaw, you can get it in the liver, you can get it in ovaries, you can get it um, to where it causes lytic lesions in bones. Um, so anywhere can be involved. Again, because these cells are in normal individuals, primarily responsible for helping us with regards to infections, these patients can be immunoglobulin deficient, which can lead to recurrent types of infections, particularly like sinopulmonary infections or skin infections. And then they can also have um, infiltration of their skin 
by the malignant cells, which can cause um, or present as a rash. So we said we were going to talk about CLL, um, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, and some people refer to that as Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, prolymphocytic leukemia, mantle cell, follicular, marginal zone, and hairy cell. So probably the most common of all of those that you will experience is CLL. Um, and CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and small lymphocytic lymphoma, or SLL, are really considered the same disease. We call it CLL when there is mostly a circulating population of abnormal cells. We call it SLL if most of the abnormal cells are confined to the lymph nodes. About 21,000 new cases in 2020 in the United States, and 7% of all non-Hodgkin's lymphomas are CLL, SLL. It's a disease of older individuals, uh, median age at diagnosis about 70 years, and as I just said, they are considered the same B-cell malignancy. We define CLL if you have an absolute lymphocyte count of over 5,000 in the peripheral blood, and they're clonal. SLL is less than 5,000 clonal lymphocytes in the peripheral blood, but lymphadenopathy and or splenomegaly. The modern sort of um, five-year survival is about 85%. So with the better therapeutic interventions that we have, we have been able to extend um, and increase the number of patients that are um, alive and, and well um, after five years of diagnosis. So how do these patients present clinically? Um, weight loss, about 10% of patients, night sweats, um, fever greater than 100.5 for greater than two weeks, and some of them may also just be very fatigued. Um, and again, those are related to sort of cytokine um, release um, related to these B cell proliferation. About five or 10% of patients will have these types of symptoms. Many of the patients that we diagnose today are actually, actually incidentally diagnosed um, based on routine CBCs, routine labs. They're completely asymptomatic. So anywhere from a half to about 90% of patients with CLL will have some degree of lymphadenopathy. 25 to 55% will have splenomegaly, 15 to 25% hepatomegaly, only about 5% will have um, infiltration of their skin by the lymphocytes, which is called leukemia acutis. CNS involvement is very rare in CLL, and that is in contrast to acute lymphocytic leukemia. So less than 1% of patients with CLL will have CNS involvement. Interestingly, they can um, present or develop this exaggerated reaction to insect bites. Um, so what would be normally just a regular little insect bite becomes very inflamed and irritated, and you may even get some necrosis of the tissue around the insect bite. So clonal proliferation of B cells, generally rare in patients less than 40 years old, but, and the incidence increases um, with age. Oftentimes, they present with pretty advanced disease, uh, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, because they have been asymptomatic, and so they may present with pretty um, advanced disease. Peripheral blood is invariably involved sometime during the clinical course, and again, absolute lymphocyte count greater than 5,000. And then in the vast majority of patients, the bone marrow is um, also involved. So peripheral blood smear generally is going to show these mature lymphocytes. And remember, the lymphocytes are generally going to be those round cells. They have a pretty high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio with just this sort of thin rim of cytoplasm. We don't see any nucleoli or other indications of immaturity. And then what we also see are these, um, some people call them smudge cells and some people call them basket cells. 
and they are just broken lymphocytes. The CLL cells seem to be a little bit more um, delicate than a normal lymphocyte. And so you can see these smudge cells um, in a peripheral smear. Most hey, of Dr. what we Dr. Brew, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We just realized I, I saw you clicking, but we haven't actually advanced with you on your slides. You have not. Um, why do you think that's happening? Sometimes, depending upon the platform, did you, when you were sharing your screen, did you share just the PowerPoint? What I would say maybe is unshare and then just share your entire screen and then select your PowerPoint. Sometimes it loses the slides. I don't know why. Okay, let's see what I have to do here then. Um, close that. Uh, close that. Okay, so let me come back to you. Um, let's see. I'm so lost. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. This is not your, this is, it's happened to me too sporadically. And I, I don't understand why sometimes Zoom decides it doesn't advance. But if you share your whole screen when you click the share, and then okay. once you, and then you, then you go to your PowerPoint and present share mode screen. from there. Whole screen, mm -hmm. share, and now, and click now your open the PowerPoint. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, don't really. This is, you are not the first and it will, you will not be the last because this just happens. And then, so now I'm seeing your display. So if you, yep, perfect. You're a pro at that. Now swap. Yep. Okay. And now we see it. Okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry. No, we thank you. No worries. It happens all the time. We are on um, CLL again. Um, so this is a peripheral blood smear of someone with CLL. Um, small lymphocytes, lots of them, right? You see a pretty homogeneous population of cells. And then what you'll also see are these smudge cells. And these are just broken um, CLL cells. Some people call them basket cells. Um, the CLL lymphocytes are a little, a little bit more delicate. So a lot of what we do in lymphoproliferative disorders these days has um, veered away from actual morphology and has leaned heavily um, into immunophenotyping, right? So um, CLL cells are um, CD5 positive. They're CD19, CD20, and CD23 positive. They have a low expression of surface immunoglobulins and CD79B. So they're CD5, CD19, CD23 positive. Um, they're also going to be CD20 positive as well. So in order to make this diagnosis, we need two um, of the following. Um, a, a monoclonal a B lymphocyte population um, greater than 5,000. And so we demonstrate that clonality on flow cytometry. If we're trying to um, diagnose SLL, we um, do a biopsy of a lymph node and we're gonna see those same small lymphocytes that are gonna have that exact same um, immunophenotypic uh, marking. There are some people who just have a benign uh, monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, it's almost like a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So they have a monoclonal population, but it's less than 5,000. They don't have any uh, lymphadenopathy or organomegaly. They don't have any cytopenias and they're completely asymptomatic. And much like monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance is gonna progress to a multiple myeloma, this will progress at a, about 1% to 2% per year. So if you do detect a monoclonal B lymphocytosis, you do have to continue to follow and monitor patients. So how are we going to evaluate these patients? Well, of course, um, history and physical, um, measurement of liver and spleen size, performance status, whether or not they have any of those symptoms that we talked about as far as B symptoms, we want a CBC, we want a comprehensive metabolic panel. And then depending on what you find, right? We might wanna do quantitative immunoglobulins in someone who's had recurrent infections. If someone's anemic, we absolutely have to evaluate whether or not they're having an autoimmune hemolysis, 
retic count, haptoglobin, and a direct antiglobulin. Depending, we may want to do CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis to evaluate whether there's lymphadenopathy, LDH, uric acid. We tend not to do bone marrows in these patients much anymore unless they're on a clinical trial or unless they have cytopenias that we can't um, explain. So there's two um, staging systems um, that are utilized. The one that you probably are gonna come in um, most uh, contact with is this RISE system, but there is a Binet system as well. Um, so the RISE system is sort of the oldest, and when you look at um, overall survival, it really correlates very well to this um, RISE system, which stage zero is just lymphocytosis, but no anemia, nothing else. Um, stage one has lymph nodes. Um, you can also have stage two with splenomegaly or hepatomegaly, but if you start getting into anemias or thrombocytopenias, then you increase your staging. So why or when do we treat people with CLL? If they have enough um, involvement of their bone marrow that they are becoming anemic or thrombocytopenic, it's an indication to consider. If the doubling time, so the time it takes for their absolute lymphocyte count to double, is less than six months, or if there's more than a 50% increase in lymphocytes over two months, that tells us that the cadence of the disease is increasing to the point where we should think about therapy. If they have symptomatic splenomegaly or lymphadenopathy, if they have an autoimmune anemia or thrombocytopenia, or if they have enough night sweats, weight loss, and fatigue that are affecting their quality of life, we should think about treating them. So we've made a lot of progress um, over time with regards to therapy for CLL. So in the 1960s, we had old-timey alkylating agents, which were chlorambucil and cyclophosphamide, and about 5% of people had a complete response. We then, um, in the 1980s, made a little bit of um, progress, and we had fludarabine and other nucleosides. We had a 5 to 20% CR rate. We added them together in the 1990s. We got a lot of side effects, but we had a 30% CR rate. And then um, we had, in the 2000s, some um, increased... Um, uh, monotherapy with alemtuzumab, we had bendamustine, and then we had the combinations of chemo and immunotherapy, and our response rates were getting better. And now, since the 2010s and forward, we've got a lot of novel agents. So we've tried to shift how we treat CLL from chemotherapeutic, because eventually people can't tolerate that anymore, to more of these novel agents, which are specifically directed against the brutin tyrosine kinase. So those are a brutinib and a calibrutinib. There are PI3 kinase inhibitors like idelalisib and umbralisib. We have the BCL2 inhibitor, which is venetoclax. And then we have a, um, another anti-CD20 uh, monoclonal antibody, which is obinutuzumab. So we've made a lot of um, progress with regards to these um, novel agents, not only in efficacy, but in also in tolerability for patients. So I thought I would show you guys um, this uh, micro environment and the um, CLL cell um, and how some of these guys work. So um, the BTK inhibitors, which are ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanubrutinib, are going to affect the brutin tyrosine kinase, which is responsible for signaling within the cell. There's venetoclax, which is going to affect um, apoptosis. And then there are um, PI3 kinase inhibitors, which are um, copanilisib, idelalisib, and umbralisib and they are going to affect the PI3 kinase pathway. There's also obinutuzumab, 
And obinutuzumab is sort of a um, uh, type 2 anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. And it does um, sort of uh, multiple things, right? So it's going to increase direct cell death because it has an alternative binding geometry versus rituximab. It's going to increase um, cell-mediated um, death. And it's also going to decrease um, CDC activity or cell-directed cytotoxicity activity. So it has some properties which may um, make it a little bit of a better option than rituximab. Um, although essentially it's going to be doing the same thing. It's going to be recognizing the CD20, although it just binds in a little bit of a different way. So you may see more and more combinations with obinutuzumab in lieu of rituximab, especially in um, CLL and some of the other um, lymphoproliferative disorders. So treatment regimens. We sort of try to um, divide these patients into high risk and low risk categories. So if you do not have a P53 mutation um, or deletion 17P, you have sort of um, low risk disease. And so we're using a lot of those targeted therapies, right? The BTK inhibitors like a calibrutinib and ibrutinib or the BCL2 inhibitor, which is venetoclax. And that's in either um, patients who are greater than 65, who don't have a lot of comorbidities, comorbidities, or patients less than 65. If you have higher risk disease, um, P53 mutation um, or 17P, still you're recommending um, these targeted agents, but you're adding in the anti-CD20 um, second uh, generation obinutuzumab. So it's a calibrutinib plus obinutuzumab or venetoclax plus um, obinutuzumab. So switching gears to lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, it is also an abnormality of small B lymphocytes, but these ones have sort of um, begun to have a little bit more differentiation into plasma cells. And so you see these um, plasma cells in the lymph nodes in the bone marrow and these what we call plasmacytoid lymphocytes. Because of this leaning towards the plasma cells, these patients, Waldenstrom's or LPL patients, usually have a monoclonal serum protein and they may actually have hyperviscosity and cryoglobulinemia. Seeing these cells circulate in the periphery is a lot less obvious than we see in CLL, but we do see these cells in the bone marrow, and it can be a nodular or diffuse pattern. Um, there's an admixture of lymphocytes, plasma cells, and plasmacytoid lymphocytes. They're B cells, so they're CD19, CD20, and CD22 positive, but unlike CLL, no CD5 and no CD23. So again, you know, rather than just relying on our eyes, we're really using this immunophenotyping to be sure that we know what we're looking at. And when we look at a bone marrow, we're gonna see these small lymphocytes right here. We're gonna see lympho, plasma cytoid cells, which are these, okay? A little bit bigger, a little bit more cytoplasm. And then we're gonna see pure out plasma cells, which are these guys, right? A little bit of an eccentrically placed nucleus and that little bit of um, halo or shadow and then a bit more cytoplasm. So we see not that monotonous population of small lymphocytes like we would see in a CLL, SLL, but we see this kind of admixture of cells. So it's rare, only about 1,000 to 1,500 new cases. Again, older population, median age at diagnosis 70 years, very few people younger than 50. Generally, they're anemic, about 50% of them. They may have night sweats, weight loss, neurologic symptoms because of this monoclonal gammopathy, and it's usually um, a symmetric sensory neuropathy in the lower extremities. 
Hyperviscosity symptoms like nosebleeds and blurred vision and headaches do occur. And if your patient has those, it's kind of a um, semi-emergent situation where we ought to really do a fundoscopic exam and look for tortuosity or sausaging of the retinal vessels and retinal hemorrhages. And if we see those things, we need to think about plasmapheresing off that increased amount of protein. Rarely do they have lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly. They may have cryoglobulins though. So if these Ig, if this um, immunoglobulin that they're producing specifically is IgM, they can have a vasculitic rash, non-healing ulcers in their lower extremities. They might have cold agglutinins, which can cause hemolysis, and they might also develop amyloid, especially if they're producing a lot of light chains. Um, renal involvement and lytic lesions are rare, unlike multiple myeloma. So it's not exactly the same as a purely um, monoclonal plasma cell population. It's got this kind of in-between thing that makes it a little bit unique. So CBC, liver and kidney function, serum protein electrophoresis, quantitative immunoglobulins, and an LDH. It's made really based on the bone marrow findings in combination with the protein electrophoresis and the clinical scenario. We have to have the following things according to the third international workshop, which includes a serum IgM of any size, involvement of the bone marrow by that um, combination of cells that we looked at, lymphocytes, lymphoplasmacytoid, and plasma cells. And the lymphocytes are gonna have surface IgM. They're gonna be B cells, right? CD19, CD20, and CD22. The plasma cells are going to express um, CD38 and 138. They're not going to be like CLL, so no CD5, no CD23. They're not going to be mantle cells, so they're not going to have cyclin D1. But a lot of these patients have this MYD88 mutation, and if we look for that, that helps us to solidify the diagnosis. So more than 90% of people um, who have uh, Waldenstrom's or lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma are gonna have that particular mutation. So just like CLL and all of the other um, low-grade lymphoproliferative disorders, we don't have to treat unless we have certain signs and symptoms, right? So again, um, constitutional symptoms. Hyperviscosity is absolutely a reason to treat if the serum IgM is greater than three grams per deciliter. Um, extramedullary organ infiltration, peripheral neuropathy, cytopenias, um, symptomatic cryoglobulinemia, symptomatic cold agglutinin, or symptomatic amyloid. And we can look for the amyloid by a fat pad biopsy or organ biopsy for the Congo red stain. And a lot of this is, um, you know, infiltration of tissues by the amyloid deposition. So the peripheral neuropathy can be caused by that. Um, malabsorption or decreased motility in the GI tract can also be caused by that. So again, we reserve therapy for symptomatic disease no clear advantage for early treatment. So these um, low-grade lymphoproliferative disorders can be really frustrating because we diagnose them, and then a lot of times we don't do anything about them for a while, but it's because we don't have what we would consider to be curative therapies for most of these. So we have therapies that will um, treat them, but invariably they recur. The sooner we use up all of our therapies, then we don't have anything to do for patients. And so we definitely try to wait. Um, we do this um, careful um, watch and wait for most of these diseases. So we use um, alkylating agents like bendamustine and cyclophosphamide. We can also use some of the proteasome inhibitors that we use for multiple myeloma, which are bortezomib, carfilzomib, and iaxomib. 
in combination with the anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody rituximab. So remember, you're going to have some plasma cells and some lymphocytes. So we use these in combination. And overall response rates between 80 and 90%, not bad. Median progression-free survival, somewhere between three and five years when we use these as frontline therapies. Abrutinib, which is a brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, is approved in both the frontline and relapse setting for these patients. So depending on the patient's performance status and other issues, you could just go straight to ibrutinib, which is an oral therapy. And when we looked at um, the data in the phase two pivotal trial, we saw that abrutinib had an overall response rate of 91%, a major response rate of 73%, and a two-year progression-free survival of 69%. So not bad um, for a targeted oral therapeutic intervention. So prolymphocytic leukemia is a proliferation of prolymphocytes. They are normal, excuse me, they are larger than normal lymphoid cells, and they do have some prominent nucleoli. To make this diagnosis, the prolymphocytes have to be more than 55% of the lymphoid cells in the peripheral blood. They're B cells. They have bright expression of surface immunoglobulin, but unlike CLL, they lack CD5 and CD23. Mantle cell, monomorphous B lymphocytes with some irregularly shaped nuclei. They can have a diffuse, a nodular, or a mantle zone pattern of growth. Just like everything else that we talked about, a disease of older adults, three to one male to female ratio. Bone marrow is involved about two thirds of the time and peripheral blood involvement can be seen in up to half. So we can do flow cytometry and um, see this population of uh, monoclonal cells. So they have um, surface immunoglobulin expression. They have pan B cell antigens. So they can sometimes get confused with um, CLL because they are CD5 positive, but unlike CLL, they're going to be CD23 negative, and they're going to have this very distinct and unique characteristic of being cyclin D1 positive. So flow is going to be very important. A lymph node biopsy is going to show this very monotonous population of these small um, lymphocytes, right? So this is what that looks like for mantle. We treat mantle very similarly to the way that we treat follicular. So we'll talk about follicular lymphomas next. So they're derived from follicle center B cells um, and a portion of the architecture is gonna be effaced by this um, nodular proliferation um, of centrocytes and centroblasts. Most people, have um, fairly disseminated disease at diagnosis, usually stage three or stage four. Unlike the other low grades, there's a very slight female predominance. Genetically, they have a 1418 translocation where the BCL2 oncogene is translocated to the immunoglobulin heavy chain. B cells, pan B cell antigens, it's going to be um, positive for CD10, but negative for CD5 and CD23. So for diseases that primarily affect the lymph node, where lymph node architecture is critical, excisional biopsy is the optimal approach for making the diagnosis. It has a nodular growth pattern. It's comprised of a mixture of cetrocytes and centroblasts. Fine needle aspiration doesn't let us see the growth pattern. It also makes grading very difficult. And so we cannot classify the grade of the follicular lymphoma. So anytime you think that your patient has lymphoma, low grade or high grade, if at all possible, 
try to go straight for this excisional biopsy because when you do find needles or even cores, we hear from the pathologist that there's lymphocytes, but we can't tell whether it is a follicular lymphoma or a mantle lymphoma um, or a marginal zone or a diffuse large. So we really need that whole lymph node to be able to figure that out. And this is the pattern um, that a follicular lymphoma will have when we see the whole lymph node. And you see the expansion of these follicles. And these are all abnormal cells within the lymph node. If you happened to stick your needle um, into this interstitial place, you wouldn't pick up these abnormal cells. So again, it's really important for that excisional biopsy. For follicular lymphomas, for mantle, um, for marginal, we want to think about what are risk factors, right? And hepatitis and HIV can influence the prognosis for patients. It also can influence our choice of therapeutic interventions. So we want to know what are your risk factors for that? CBC, uh, peripheral blood smear, um, CMP, LDH. Hepatitis serologies, particularly for B and C, because we need to know this if we're going to give anti-CD20 directed therapy. HIV screening, also probably important. CT scans, absolutely useful. And PET scans are also useful. And the reason we do PET scans in this particular low-grade lymphoma is that there's the potential to upstage anywhere from 10 to 60% of patients, and that may change our management. So if we see things on a PET that we didn't appreciate on CT scans or by physical exam, that may influence our decision to treat a patient and what we treat them with. So the staging system that we use for um, follicular lymphomas is Lugano, and it's one, two, three, four. I apologize for the lack of the V. Um, so stage one is a single um, region or single extranodal site. Um, two or more regions is two. Uh, both sides of the diaphragm is three. And then um, extra lymphatic um, involvement is four. Um, and prognosis changes um, with each um, increasing stage, but as I mentioned earlier, for follicular lymphomas, we're almost always going to see people in stage three or stage four. So we think of this as being a relatively um, systemic disease, and we tend to not approach it with local therapeutic interventions, but we tend to approach it more with systemic um, therapeutic interventions. So here's a graphing, right, of thinking about first line therapy. If it's truly um, stage one or two, you could think about radiation, which would be involved field radiation, um, or you could do watch and wait. Um, if it's a low tumor burden, um, you can also do watch and wait if it's even a higher stage. If it's a higher tumor burden, um, anti-CD20 therapy, either um, rituximab or obinutuzumab with bendamustine, um, lenalidomide, um, or other chemotherapeutic options like CHOP or cytoxan vincristine prednisone. For second line therapy, um, we again can use um, lenalidomide. Um, we can use some of the um, uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors like um, cobanilisib or idelilisib. We can do CAR T therapy. Um, we can also think about um, autologous um, stem cell transplants for eligible patients. And in very rare patients, we can think about um, allogeneic um, stem cell transplants. Remember, just like all of the other low-grade lymphoproliferatives, this is, tends to be a bit of an older population. And so we have to tailor our therapeutic interventions to any other um, comorbidities. So when do we treat, right? So high tumor bulk is defined as any tumor greater than seven centimeters, more than three lymph nodes in three distinct areas, which are each greater than three, 
symptomatic spleen enlargement, organ compression, ascites or pleural effusions. And then there's this GELF criteria, which high tumor bulk, uh, B symptoms, um, performance status, which is greater than one, um, or um, a significantly elevated LDH or beta-2 microglobulin. So in spite of the high efficacy in first-line regimens, and so we get a CR rate of around 60%, none of the conventional treatment options are curative. And so there's going to be relapse. The 10-year overall survival, however, is about 71% currently. And a lot of these older patients can anticipate a relatively normal life expectancy, um, even with their follicular lymphoma, succumb to something else not directly related um, to their follicular lymphoma. Um, lenalidomide is an immunomodulatory agent, and um, it acts via natural killer cell activation and antibody-dependent cytotoxicity of T cells. So it's sort of harvesting and trying to increase your NK cell activity, which is why it's a, a useful drug um, in this disease. I just wanted to kind of show you guys sort of what all is out there, right? So obinutuzumab with bendamustine, um, Dr. Chesson, who worked here, um, overall response rates in the mid-60s. Um, lenalidomide plus rituximab, overall response rates again in the 60s, but CR only 20%. If you add in that second generation obinutuzumab to lenalidomide, you get um, CR of 78% and a two-year progression-free survival that's in the 60s. PI3 kinase inhibitors, um, duvalisib, um, CR not very good. Um, uh, this one was I can't, I, I can't, icopanilisib, which um, CR is of 20%. BTK inhibitors as a single agent, not very good CRs, but response rates that are not bad. Um, if you combine ibrutinib with a second generation anti-CD20, you get overall response rates of about 85%. When we look at antibody drug conjugates, we start to improve our CR rates. Um, so bendamustine plus rituximab plus polituzumab, we get CR rates in the 60s. Um, we have histone deacetylase inhibitors, which are having some pretty good overall response rates. Nivolumab, checkpoint inhibitor, um, overall response rate of about 40% with 10% CRs. Um, we look at a different um, checkpoint inhibitor, which is pedil pedilizumab with rituximab with some maintenance therapy. We're getting CRs in the 52% range. Um, and then with CAR-T, um, and these are people, of course, that have um, failed multiple lines of therapy. We had an overall response rate of 89% and a CR rate of 71%. What we don't know about a lot of these more recent studies, checkpoint inhibitors and CAR-T, is how long are these CRs going to last? And does this CR actually mean cure? Or does it just mean a longer progression-free survival? And does it actually change the overall survival for these patients? So that's what we're trying to understand, um, specifically about follicular, but about a lot of these low-grade lymphoproliferative processes is, are interventions really curing people? Or are they just giving us a longer disease-free interval and people are still gonna have a relapsing course. And here's just a schematic to sort of remind us kind of what and where all of these things work, right? A follicular lymphoma cell, um, we've got the BCL2 antagonist, we've got BTK and PI3 kinase inhibitors, um, we have the immunomodulator lenalidomide, um, we've got the CAR T cell, we've got the CD20 antibodies, whether they're first or second generation, and then we've got the checkpoint inhibitors, whether they're PD1 or PDL1 inhibitors. 
So marginal zone lymphomas, about five to 10% of all non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. This is what they look like underneath the microscope. Again, it's really that sort of monomorphic uh, lymphocytic infiltrate. However, it's not in that nodular pattern like we see in follicular. Proliferation of small B lymphocytes. So we can have three different kinds. We can have extranodal marginal zone of malt tissue, which is mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. So this is gonna be mostly in your GI tract. We can have nodal marginal zones, which are confined to the lymph nodes. And then we can have splenic marginal zone, which these lymphocytes are derived from the marginal zones of the splenic white pulp. Characterized, again, by that monoclonal proliferation of B cells. So they're gonna be CD19, CD20 positive, but they're negative for CD5, CD10, CD23, and CD25. They're also gonna be negative for cyclin D1. So we really need an excisional biopsy again, um, gold standard, right? Chest, abdomen, and pelvis CT adequately stage. Because this is such a low grade disease, PETs may not be particularly useful because they have really low um, FDG avidity. So you may not get a lot more information in a marginal zone from a PET versus a CT scan. So with gastric marginal zone, a lot of that is gonna be associated with H. pylori infections. And the initial therapy is treatment of the H. pylori. About 75% of patients will um, have remission of the lymphoma if you're able to eradicate the H. pylori. So it's the infection that is um, stimulating and, and antagonizing the immune system to the point where the lymphoma is apparent. If you get rid of that stimulation, the lymphoma will resolve. If patients have disseminated disease, but they're asymptomatic, then you can observe them until they become symptomatic. For symptomatic people who require therapy, they've got ulcers, they're having GI bleeding, they're having obstruction from masses that may develop in the small intestine or other places, then you can use rituximab alone or in combination. And patients who relapse after rituximab combination therapy can um, receive the BTK inhibitor ibrutinib. So it is FDA approved for relapse or refractory marginal zone. And last but not least, hairy cell. Um, so unlike our other leukemias, um, hairy cell rarely has an increased white blood cell count. And almost all of these patients are going to present with pancytopenia. They almost always have splenomegaly. And when we look at their bone marrow, these cells have what's called a fried egg appearance. Oftentimes we don't get any aspirate. So we try, try, we get a dry tap because of the fibrosis that's there. But when we do a biopsy, we'll see these cells. They are B cells and they express CD19, CD20, but they're negative for CD5, CD10, and CD23 but they are positive for CD25 and CD103. So they have a characteristic uh, immunophenotype. In the peripheral blood, if you're lucky enough to um, see a hairy cell, they're gonna look like one of these top two, right? A little bit higher magnification here. And they have this um, rough looking or hairy looking cytoplasm. In the bone marrow biopsy, they look like this. So unlike those previous ones we were seeing with those small lymphocytes all kind of crowded together, these guys have all this clear space. And some pathologists thought that this looked like a fried egg, um, but they have all of this clear space. It's very characteristic um, for um, hairy cell. So um, four to one male predominance 
and whites are more often affected than other races. One thing that sometimes shows up on boards is that um, hairy cells have a very specific um, isoenzyme that they express called tartrate resistant acid phosphatase or TRAP. So we used to do a TRAP stain on hairy cells to look and make the diagnosis before we had immunophenotyping. So hairy cells are going to be TRAP positive. It's indolent. Not all people need to be treated. We treat people who have symptomatic splenomegaly, early satiety, abdominal discomfort, etc. If you're asymptomatic, we generally don't treat you unless you have severe cytopenias. So an ANC less than 1,000, a hemoglobin less than 12, or a platelet count less than 100,000. Dramatic changes in hairy cell treatment with the introduction of um, purine nucleoside analogs because we can achieve CR with durable remissions. So pentostatin was the first drug that we looked at. The second one is cladribine. And either cladribine or pentostatin are now the first line treatments and have really altered the course of this disease from being sort of something that people had to kind of deal with, low grade chronic, to truly um, very long duration CRs and or cures. The next breakthrough was the discovery of this BRAF pathway as a major driver um, in patients with hairy cell. Um, and they almost all have this BRAF V600E mutation. Um, it's been seen in a number of solid tumors and it results in constitutive activation of BRAF and increased gene expression. Um, and so people are trying to now target this specific mutation as a next generation of therapeutic options um, for patients with um, hairy cell. So new developments. 